That Great Business Show. Winner, Highly Commended Award, Irish Podcast Awards. Welcome to episode 184 of That Great Business Show, home of great business tips, insights, and opportunities on every episode. Delivered, as always, in our commute-friendly package. Unlock the full potential of your business with Mentors Work, Ireland's award-winning, fully government-funded mentoring program designed to fuel the growth of your business, no matter the sector or size. Mentors Work will help transform your business by providing tailored guidance through one-on-one mentoring sessions, upskilling workshops, as well as networking opportunities. Together with your mentor, you'll also craft a customized six-month business plan to propel your business forward. Tried and tested and already empowering over 3,000 Irish businesses register for free today on mentorswork.ie. I'm Conal O'Mora and Foltisteach. On this episode, getting in touch with your inner CEO. Spend just 20 minutes listening to our guest and you may hear some nuggets that could literally change your personal and business life. Also, what's the best way to fund? We have a scaling medtech company that is funding using a slightly alternative route, one that might just suit your business. De facto, the revolutionary shaving oil, changing the face of shaving. For the smoothest shave of your life, just add water. No more lathering up or cleaning up afterward. Just add a few drops of water and you're ready to go. De facto's blend of all natural oils hydrates and protects your skin. No more razor burns or irritation. A spa treatment for your face. Perfect for all skin types and lasts so much longer than traditional foams or gels. De facto, a shaving revolution. Just add water. Available from selected pharmacies and from defactoshave.com. Bear with me on this one. Diastolic heart failure is, I know, unlikely to grab the attention of your business brain. However, if I mention Craigana, a company that many, if not most of you, have never heard of, you might just think again. Craigana Medical was founded by a true entrepreneur, the late Ian Quinn, in Galway in 1980. He started by making those metal boxes that housed early desktop computers, and he ended up, as I think, the world's largest maker of heart stents, eventually sold in 2016 for 820 million euro. I was once privileged to have shared a stage with Ian, who told us his incredible story of huge ups and downs, and of course that final massive up. Now, Craigana has only a very, very tenuous connection with my first guest, who is Donald Hickey. Donald's backstory is great in itself, but the connection is the heart. Donald is co-founder of Pump in Heart. From what I can see on their website, it does what the name suggests. It's a little pump that whirs away in your heart, and the makers say they can sort the aforementioned diastolic heart failure, which has a grim prognosis. So finally, coming to the point, you can make a lot of moolah from helping hearts do their thing. Donald Hickey, welcome to that great business show, and sorry about the huge, big, long introduction. And thank you very much, Colonel. Uh, delighted to be here. Pump and Heart, tell us all about it, first of all. Well, really, uh, Pump and Heart is about treating advanced stage heart failure. So it's all about advanced stage heart failure. And what is advanced stage heart failure? That is when a patient is breathless, has, you know, is breathless even at rest. These are patients who are, you know, unable to walk across the room without being unable to breathe who will be therefore admitted to hospital and put on a, you know, oxygen or other uh, medications, but the medications don't address mortality, unfortunately. So, and particularly so for a diastolic. So when you go to your, your, you know, to get your blood pressure measured, you will, you will leave with two numbers, one over another number. So the the number on the top is your uh, systolic uh, blood pressure. It shouldn't be more than 120. I have to say mine is usually a bit higher. It's probably a little bit more higher now. Not at all. Cam is a cucumber. But the the other number is your diastolic 
blood pressure, and that uh, usually shouldn't be more than about 80 millimetres of mercury. Systolic blood pressure is when the heart is contracting, it creates pressure. Uh, it needs to contract to push blood around your body, uh, oxygenated blood around your body. And then diastolic blood pressure is when the heart is relaxing. It's actually um, drawing blood into the same chamber that it needs to, to contract again, to push the blood again. That's the heart. That's the cardiac cycle. So about half of all heart failure patients have systolic heart failure, also known as, and this is a bit of a mouthful, so forgive me, heart failure with reduced ejection fraction because they fail to pump blood. They fail to, to contract, the, you know, contract their hearts effectively to push blood all around their body. Then the other half of, of uh, heart failure patients have what's what mentioned as diastolic heart failure. And there's a bit of another mouthful coming with this that is a, a heart failure with preserved ejection fraction. So they're, they're fine with actually squeezing the heart, but they just can't relax the heart and they can't be, relax the heart because the heart has become, you know, stiff as a result of chronic hypertension, largely due to age, uh, also due to obesity, uh, diabetes, kidney uh, disease, other, other, other problems. So and there's they a tend lot of women. it about. Well, um, in the US and Europe, there would be about 2 million advanced stage diastolic heart failure patients. And, and that is the target group uh, for our, our, our therapy. There are, there are, by the way, just, just, just to say that ad, to get to an advanced stage, it takes a while. So most of the, the patients uh, with common form uh, diastolic heart failure, or HEF-PEF for short, are over 65. In fact, 99% of these patients are over 65. Twice as many women suffer from diastolic heart failure compared to men. That's a surprise. Well, if you, if you take what's known as heart attack alley, it tends to be, you know, 50s to early 60s. And that's when men tend to get heart attacks. They tend to get heart attacks more as a result of a coronary blockage causing a myocardial infarction and, 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 a, and, and, and a, a, a basically scarring of the, the muscle tissue in the heart that causes the contraction. So those that survive the heart attacks uh, go on to develop, many cases will go on to develop systolic heart failure because that, that muscle is weakened and therefore is unable to contract. Whereas the other type of heart failure comes from, the, from hypertension, which is, of course, high blood pressure, and that's caused by poor lifestyle, perhaps, we talked about obesity. Unfortunately, those with diabetes are more prone to, to that. And, and so it, it, is, it tends to happen older. Now, I, I have to remind you, this is a business podcast we've done on the medicine. <laughs> so okay. there ends medicine today. Okay, I get, I get it. But <laughs> until you understand, though, this, this space is completely unmet in terms of Which a medical is fascinating. Meat. Why? I mean, good God, you said two million in America. There are a lot of people trying to solve this problem. There have been a lot of people trying to solve this problem for a long time. I suppose in part, there were a number of reasons why it wasn't dealt with some time back. Or, uh, and that's in part because it was quite difficult to diagnose. A diastolic heart failure was, was really diagnosed by exclusion. You know, it wasn't if you, you could diagnose systolic heart failure, but it wasn't so easy to diagnose diastolic heart failure because there were so many other diseases around it that they could, it could be a metabolic disease, it could be something else. And as a result, it wasn't, it sort of wasn't uh, addressed with the same urgency. Also, it was a women's disease. It was slightly older. So guess what? Men's diseases get more attention than it women's It is so diseases. true. We had a company on called Sisterly and they were telling me all of the above that women's, even <clears throat> something as simple as women's heart attacks do not present the same way as you, yours and mine will, on, hopefully not. But you know what I mean? It will. I mean, if, if you were to uh, look at all the cardiologists in, in Ireland, you would see that this is, there are fantastic uh, female cardiologists, but the vast majority of the cardiologists are male. So, you know, it, and, and uh, as a cardiology uh, uh, you know, device 
a developer, we're also guilty. That's where we find we find a lot of our, our, our experts are our men. Did I describe the product correctly? It's a little whirry, little pumpy thingy. Absolutely. How yes. did you come up with this? And how, I mean, it's teeny. It's the same size, I think, as, as a double A uh, or a triple A. Well, it's it's at the moment, the prototype is same, same, same size as a double A. And Battery. we need to get it down to about, about a, treble, a treble A in terms of diameter. And this goes into your heart. So this device is implanted. If you take this this group of patients, they tend to be over 65. They tend to be, uh, you know, obese or, or frail uh, uh, you know, diabetics. And so they're not suited to open heart surgery. So they, they're, they're typically not candidates for a heart transplant. They're typically not candidates for a much larger type of pump, which, uh, which, is, uh, which is available to slightly younger, typically male, and patients with, with heart failure. So this type of heart failure means that, you, you know, something different had to be arrived at. And I did not invent this. This was invented by Dr. Amr Hamid, who it was a brilliant medical device researcher, a lecturer at the Royal College of Surgeons in Ireland. He has a background in cardiothoracic surgery, that is open heart surgery, prior to taking up the role of lecturer in anatomy at the Royal College of Surgeons. And then, you know, after having served as a visiting scientist in taking the, the role of visiting scientist in various different uh, institutes around the world, including MIT and, and other places, he, he, he came up with this concept, which was, is, is, is very revolutionary. And it's, it's, a, it's, a, it's a tiny pump that's implantable in a cath lab. And that is such a, a big difference to uh, implanting a pump or a tra- heart transplant in a fully resourced you know, cardiac theater. And then the patient can literally spend one overnight stay and, and leave the following day, be discharged and return home to lead an active and, and fulfilling life with the, with the device inside. And again, to put it in context, you did say that many have tried to fix this before. And that the, well, you guys, uh, I think on your own website, refer to it as a moonshot. It is. It's a it, long shot. It, it is an absolute moonshot because it's got, it's got three different uh, technology platforms that we have to innovate. Uh, in. And first of all is the, the pump itself, which is going to be, which is, is tiny and, and we have to miniaturize it further. And that's a challenge. Then that's how the pu- pump is actually going to be held steady, uh, permanently and safely. Um, in the heart, in the, and that's the anchoring mechanism. The, the delivery of the device, which itself is, is you know, extraordinary. But uh, having, having said that, while these are technical challenges, each of these areas are, are at an absolutely, uh, uh, you know, point of, of maturity, which makes this uh, ideal time to do, to do what we're doing. And reading about it, it could be, massive. And therefore, I was wondering, and I have to give Chris Burge of CrowdSpark funding a shout out here because uh, he is, it was, who told me about you guys. Why did you not go VC to fund this? You are you are going to launch a crowdfunding, which is kind of low tech for something very high tech. Uh, it's not, it's not for want of asking, by the <laughs> way. So we, we have, we have, of course, spoken to lots of, so this, 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 um, company was spun out of the Royal College of Surgeons in Ireland in January 2022, February 2022, in fact. After that, we spent a lot of our time working out you know, business plans, trying to put together the right team. Um, and we were very lucky to attract uh, you know, Dara Coggan from Boston Scientific. Just before you go and start name checking everybody, your website has the biggest team I've ever seen of more, I'd say you own most of the PhDs in the world, plus the MDs, plus every other D that we're, you could have. We're very fortunate when we describe what we're trying to do to people in this space who are the key opinion leaders in this space around the world. They become very excited and they want to be involved. They see this is such a non-medical need. The clinicians see it with their patients. They're so frustrated that they can't treat their patients. Uh, and that the patients, uh, you know, are unsuited to hospital and spend a long time in hospital. The families suffer, the hospitals suffer because of the cost of maintaining the patients in the hospital. 
and then they die in hospital. Very high mortality rates, rates associated with, with, with FF in hospitals. And this is why so I mentioned that's why Cregana. They get I mean, Cregana, does, do the VCs, have they not, do they not remember when money was money back in 2016? I said 820 million euro. Yeah. That is a chunk of change for an Irish company. Well, I mean, I think if we were to be acquired, we would, we would be expecting to be acquired for a figure about half of that. That would be looking at 400 billion as an acquisition. At the moment. Sort of, at the moment. And yeah. that's because it, that would be within, within the bounds of what is ex, would be expected for this type of device with the costs involved of developing. The costs are not in, insignificant. There's, there are some significant technical challenges which have to be over, overcome significant regulatory uh, pathway challenges that we, we, we have to address. But the opportunity is phenomenal. I mean, if you, having done the reimbursement analysis on this with some, you know, really great reimbursement people. What does that reimbursement mean? Is that American so it's, um, so, insurance? So, so, we, so who is paying for this? This is the question. Who's actually going to pay for it? Well, the patients are over 65. So that means that they're, they're, they will be mostly on on um, Medicare in the US, NHS in the UK, they're, they're retired, so they're on free medi- medical care throughout Europe. So the state will be paying for this. So the... The lucky taxpayer. So the lucky taxpayer will be paying for this. And the lucky taxpayers, the, 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 the national health care systems, looking at the disease, see that the cost of a patient remaining in hospital is such a challenge. There is a hundred billion dollar cost uh, projected for this disease in 2030. This is just extraordinarily expensive uh, to all involved. And so, so they, they will want to see a, uh, so if, if, a, if a solution, if a treatment is available and it seems like reasonable value for money, it will be prescribed and it will be delivered. So where are you at? Now, let me put in all the caveats. I don't want to see anybody or hear anybody giving out to me that I gave them the wrong investment advice. Go and take professional advice. Now, start talking to me about crowdfunding. Why crowdfunding? Five million okay. euro? Yeah, that's, well, no, the valuation is, is, uh, is a three million uh, euro. So we're not concerned, too concerned about, you know, dilution. We understand that there's going to be a lot of money required to, to fund this. this d- 10 million, d- d- 50 million? We're looking at, um, to get to the point of a, an acquisition, we would certainly have to have got human data. So first in human data, and it's going to cost um, at least 10 million to get to that point, to get to a more convincing uh, point of sale, I suppose. It would be a uh, early feasibility study that would probably cost uh, another 20 to 30 million on top of that. And then to get it to market uh, will cost between, you know, 100 and 200 million after that. Okay. But, but, Chunky. But the, but the plan would be, uh, as is often the case with MedTechs, is once, once you get to the point of a, an early feasibility study or even a first in human, the companies that want to see this on the market and see that they can make a lot of money on the market, they're the ones who have the money to take it to the market. They will want to see it, that happen and they will want to, to see that progressed in that way. Pre the 250 million of my cost or post the 250 million? I'm trying to figure out uh, are they, you said an acquisition f- uh, figure of something like 400 million. Well, 400 do, do million. Do you need 250 is... million in to get your 400 million out? Oh, excuse me. Uh, that's a, good, that's a good, good question. Essentially, the, the, you know, the, the purchase price that, for example, Farapulse, uh, well, you know, Farapulse was acquired by Boston Scientific. There are all kinds of different acquisitions. I mean, if you look at, uh, and, and Farapulse was acquired by, by Boston Scientific for about 450 million. Now, that would have started off with Boston Scientific making an investment of, say, 27% uh, of equity in Farapulse with an option to acquire the balance if the results were good following the, mm-hmm. you know, certain period. And that would have been around a early feasibility or, or, you know, early human data. So they, they've effectively funded the PMA study or the pivotal study to get the device to market. And that's been a great success. At the same time, Boston Scientific will make a number of these investments and will only expect one in every four to really, you know, do well. Hence your moonshot. And yes, so we are a moonshot and we appreciate that. So 
What are the details of the funding? Who could, should, might invest on the crowdfunding platform Spark Crowdfunding? Okay, so that's, so we, I really haven't addressed your first question, was about why, why not in venture capital. Okay, well, we did ask, obviously, venture capital, and there are venture capitalists who, who, who venture capital, a business who are interested in investing, but we're still very early stage. And when a company is at a very early stage, they need other kinds of investment. They need um, angel investment, and there are angels uh, interested, and then uh, the other forms of investment is crowdfunding. And I think uh, Spark have done a mar- marvelous job uh, with uh, some of the other clients, uh, including uh, Origen Medical would be a very good example. You know, Tony Halloran is a super uh, unit leader and has made a great success of, of what they're doing. And it's a very ambitious product and they have gone back to Spark twice to raise funds. The other source of funds then are, are um, grants. But in order to get some of the larger grants from Europe or even from Enterprise Ireland, you need matching funds. So or you need to be able to demonstrate that there is a, a likely flow of, of matching funds. So, so, so that's why um, crowdfunding is such a great uh, starting point. I presume you're not allowed to tell me what the return might be. Of course, I can't say what the retur- turn, uh, <laughs> return would be, but certainly we would expect, we, we, would, we would hope, and this is with all the caveats that you, you <laughs> And I'll give you earlier. plenty more if you want them. Plenty I'm more. not going to get involved in any of that stuff, yeah. But we would certainly be targeting a 10x. Uh, return on your investment. And for those who do not understand that, it means 10 times your money. That's right. But this is a risky yeah. investment. Of course it is, yeah. Yeah. So that's why it has that profile. And uh, that's from, uh, yeah, yeah. We, uh, 10x reminds you of uh, uh, Professor Curley and his 10x strategies for the world and everything else. So anybody can get involved, can they? Absolutely. I think 100 euro uh, is enough to Matter, to, to chuck, great, to chuck in. If you're, quid, you're just to take an interest in punting money. I mean, we, of course, there are some people we're talking to who want to put in a lot more than that. But really, it's for everyone. And that's the great thing about crowdfunding. You can get involved. And that's probably a great way to, to learn about uh, the sector as well before perhaps making it more serious. Can, and of course, it has a tax incentive too, because this, this particular crowdfunding opportunity is, is, comes with the EIIS accreditation. And so what happens is if you invest a thousand euro because of the tax breaks, you're, you're effectively getting two, a 2,000 uh, euros worth of investment. And you're going along for the ride, which is the fun part, because then they will, I'm sure, update you as you go along and you hear about the ups and the downs. Well, <laughs> there will be downs, you can be sure, but there may be big ups as well. Remind people again, Craig Anna. In fact, when I mentioned Craig Anna to you, you knew it immediately. Oh, of course. Everyone knows about Craig Anna. Well, not everybody does because it just happened. I happened to meet Ian Quinn uh, once upon a time and I learned, I mean, I was astounded by the story. I think it's very hard for people to realise how, how well respected Ireland is on the international front and in particular Galway. In MedTech. In MedTech. Yeah. It's an extraordinary success story and it has come from uh, the success of companies and particularly Craig Anna uh, in Galway. I mean, I would, we, we, are, we are an RCSI spin out, but where are we going to set up? We're going to set up in Galway. We're going to set up where all the med tech startups, uh, at least the ones that uh, I respect, are setting up. And that's in the, the Atlantic uh, Technological University uh, iHubs uh, Incubator Centre, which has incredible facilities. It has more within the incubator itself and then beside the incubator are even more facilities and, and it's got a very good relationship with the, with the hospital across the road. So, you know, it's, it's really a, an absolutely super place to work and to, to set up a new business. And I'm going to try to get you to base your US element in Connecticut. I know you have other plans, but uh, Governor Ned Lamont and myself will have a little chat about you hey. and we'll see whether we can get you located there. Now, final question as I ask everybody, Donald, Hiskey, uh, uh, Donald Hickey even, who would you hire in a heartbeat? Yeah, this is a really difficult one. And I, 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 as I said, we've been really lucky when we've asked people, would they, would they like to work with us? They've all said yes. And they have not asked for money, which is really great. <laughs> yes. It's worth, I'll say it again, it's worth looking at the website. It is a who's who of med. It's these, mad. these people are at the top of their game. So when I think of someone, when I think of all the people I've asked to work for us and the, or work with us at least, the numbers who have said yes. And we've had people approach us 
who have developed heart pumps before and who just want to work with us because they believe in what we're doing. But I have to, I have to come back to one person who I think I would love to work with us, uh, but there's no way it's ever going to happen, of course. And her, her name is Ellen Roach. So she's an assistant professor at MIT, a, a biomedical engineer and um, a Galway graduate uh, who is very well known and has done a lot of work around uh, structural heart, particularly heart pumps. So boy, would we love if she was to come and work for us. But that's not going to happen. I know that. Ellen, you're hired. Come on, come back <laughs> home. And uh, yeah, when if she, did you say she's ex-Galway herself? She is indeed. Imagine yes, yes, that yes. she could come home, look out over Galway Bay oh, and pump, pump for that a would living. Be, that would be fantastic. <laughs> Ellen Roach, you are hired. And uh, thank you. Thank you again so much, Donald Hickey, who is co-founder of Pump in Heart. It does what it says in the tin, etc. Crowdfunding, and it starts when? And the crowdfunding campaign will begin at the end of this week. Cool. So time to get to it. That great business show. De facto, the revolutionary shaving oil, changing the face of shaving. For the smoothest shave of your life, just add water. No more lathering up or cleaning up afterward. Just add a few drops of water and you're ready to go. De facto's blend of all natural oils hydrates and protects your skin. No more razor burns or irritation. A spa treatment for your face. Perfect for all skin types and lasts so much longer than traditional foams or gels. De facto, a shaving revolution. Just add water. Available from selected pharmacies and from defactoshave.com. That great business show. Winner, highly commended award. Irish Podcast Awards. On that great business show, we like the soft skills. They're scientifically validated psychological insights that can make your business and personal life better. And if you're like us, then you should listen back to interviews we've done over the years with Dr. Brian Penny, who said simply moving can change your mood. Brian McGill, who took the bull out of team building. Dermot Whelan, who stopped us breathing, literally to calm us down, and the fabulous Dr. Yolanta Burke from the Royal College of Surgeons, who advised putting a photo of loved ones on your desk to bring your blood pressure down. Today on That Great Business Show, we bring you Shane Craddock, a one-time biochemical engineer who worked with Portamona and PepsiCo International, and who says his subtractive methodology, as opposed to the widely advocated additive approach, can help you take back control, boost your mood and confidence, and ultimately help achieve your full potential. And I'm sure Shane Craddock will explain all of that because Shane Craddock, welcome to That Great Business Show. Thank you, Connell. It's great to be here. Subtractive methodology as opposed to the widely advocated additive approach. I can hardly read it. <laughs> <laughs> Say it backwards and we'll see, see how good you are. Yeah, well, look, I tell you what, but before, let's go back a step in terms of something you said about, about the soft skills. And there's a movement, I think, happening at a wider level in terms of business and leadership context to perhaps rename the soft skills into uh, real skills. And you could say the key skills for the coming time. Because if you look at things like the soft skills or the real skills, there are things like emotional intelligence, uh, creativity, uh, leadership, the ability to communicate, ability to think critically, think laterally, uh, to be present, to cope with stress. So there's a lot of stuff that would have seen as kind of soft, which is almost like a, it's kind of a, I don't know, it's not the, it, there's a historical term around that that's probably not the best. But real skill is better because, especially in the in the era of AI, they're the skills that we're all looking for to to grow our businesses, but also actually even to be better humans. So, but what do they all have in common? From my point of view, the one thing they all have in common is that they're all inner skills. So they're, they're coming from the inner world. And that's, I suppose, the, the aspect that I'm very interested in. So if you're taking, um, I suppose in my work is I work with a lot of CEOs and leaders, business owners uh, as a performance and leadership advisor or coach. And what I've learned over the years, I'm doing this about 30 years. And what I've learned over the years is that while the outer, st- outer skills or even hard skills are extremely important, they can't work as well if your inner soft or real skills aren't quite sharp so sharp enough or in the right space. So what does the additive subtractive approach mean? Well, once you get into it, and there's a little bit of education here around the inner world and the mind, 
you realize how conditioned we are in our minds and all this kind of what I would call mental gunk. It's almost like our thinking really interferes with our natural ability to adapt and be resilient and be creative. And in a way, the subtractive approach is to once you understand the importance and the criticality of your inner world, that you start to kind of remove some of the thoughts or thinking or even beliefs that are blocking your ability to kind of move forwards. So does that make any sense? Mm, I'm listening, I'm <laughs> listening. Bring me into your inner mind, or into your, into your inner world. How do I get in there? What's, you, say, you say it's full <laughs> I, of gunk. You, you have no idea how much gunk is in mine. Well, first of all, I don't want you in, in my inner world, Connell. Like, you, know, you, you can maintain yours, I'll maintain mine. But, but actually, it's funny because actually people do, you know, get into your head. Like, I mean, it's very easy, like it's gamesmanship and sport can happen in business and negotiations, things like that. But the person who blocks you the most generally is ourselves. And so I think most people, you know, anybody listening to this will realize, like, you have an inner voice. And that inner voice really, as you could say, is the source of your thinking. But very rarely do we ever question or challenge our thinking. And a key element of your inner world, I mean, your experience is created by your thinking. A second, is that true? Do we ever query our inner voice? Is that not the normal thing when you say, should I do that or should I not? Or maybe I shouldn't jump over that cliff or maybe I shouldn't drive so fast. Is that not yourself having an inner conversation? That's a good point. Like to me, that's not querying your inner voice because you're caught up with the inner voice. You're believing, oh, should I not do this, should I not do that? Well, why not question the voice in the first place? Should I even be listening to that inner voice? And more and more what you're finding is that to me, the answer is probably no. Go on, because I'm just thinking to myself, well, there's nobody else who's going to talk to me. Nobody else is going to talk to you. Well, I'll talk to you. Well, uh, you, you know what I'm saying is, how would you stop yourself from thinking or talking to yourself? No, I wouldn't stop myself from thinking. But, um, you know, if from my background, you know, 30 years ago, I found myself in a very difficult situation personally, which is what led me into this work weirdly. Insofar as that I found myself in a very dark, depressive space in my 20s. And I, if I if I read it correctly, you were suicidal at that stage, am I right? Yes, I was, and I don't like I wouldn't say that lightly, but I definitely. Oh no, that's why you don't say it lightly. We say it like with respect. Yeah, yeah, no. So it was very much uh, in a very dark space, and I was very lucky even to be to get out of that and to be here. It's not dead. I'm not grateful for it. But if you were inside my mind at that time, that inner voice you were talking about told me to check out off the planet, and that's incredibly bad. Like that's the worst place you want to end up. And I believe my inner voice because I didn't understand. I, I, I just thought, well, if my inner voice says it, nobody ever told me to question it. Just, well, that's the way it is. And what I've since realized because I got a second chance then started to kind of move in this direction, which has led me from, as you said, you know, biochemical, biochemical engineering into perhaps you could say maybe people engineering where I help leaders to understand their inner world and then to re-engineer they're thinking so that they can better navigate towards what they want to create, whether that's a business goal or whether that's a personal goal. But the inner voice is probably a key element of it. And actually, just just so you're clear that it's not just Shane, you know, wandering around talking about the inner voice. I mean, I, I'll often talk to myself, Connell, and I, you know, I, I value my thinking. But as I, I say to my clients, I say, listen, you have thinking and it's incredible and you've got a mind and that's even more incredible. But you're not your mind and you're not your thinking. Now, at that time in my life, in my 20s, I thought I was my thinking. Therefore, so if I thought I was my thinking, well, then I do what my thinking says. That's, as I found out, very dangerous. But the gift in that very difficult time for me was that I woke up to the fact that, hang on a second here, I'm aware of what I'm thinking. There's an observer behind my thinking. That's the bit that's me. That's the bit that's you. And so I have a choice as to whether I want to listen to my thinking or not. And the, the other element, and I realize, you know, a lot of my clients, I'll bore them with this, but it's the critical point is that your thinking changes with your mood, you know, so... I can understand that. I can, yeah, I can yeah, identify yeah. with that. So, yeah. so therefore, if your mood goes down, like the same you and the same situation, but if your mood is up or down, your thinking will be different. And so I'll always say to clients, listen, if, you, if your mood is low, don't trust your thinking, challenge it. And even better, sometimes just don't listen to it. And give me a case study of how one challenges your voice, your inner voice. How do you actually do it? Well, I think it's just even to be aware of the fact that you can. Like, so for example, to me, your inner voice is coming from a part of your mind that is in the unconscious mostly. So it's usually based on your beliefs and your opinions and your values and your experiences and your knowledge, which is very much very random. You know, I grew up in Kilkenny. I'm Irish. Um, I've traveled around some of the world and then I'm living in Ashford in County Wicklow. Um, but I've had experiences along the way. But they're all very random for Shane. And so, you know, when things happen, I, my mind will give me, well, this is what you should do here, here and here. 
but that's not necessarily always the best. And my beliefs should be challenged. If I want to grow, I should challenge my beliefs. Most people, I think, it, like to me, it's 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 not complicated. Like, you know, it could be as simple as, I guarantee you that somebody isn't listening to this right now kind of going, hang on a second here, what, what inner voice is he talking about? And I'm going to say to that person, that inner voice. And what I'm saying is that inner voice isn't you. You're the observer behind that inner voice. So what is that inner voice? That inner voice to me is a part of my inner world. It's a part of my inner team. So... As I say, it represents, it's kind of, it will comment, it'll narrate and comment on all aspects of my life. And it has got a role. It's, it's quite helpful at times. I mean, it's an aspect of my mind that I can use to, I can use it to, you know, uh, create a book. I can use it to create a product or I can use it to create a business. But it very often comes from the analytical or intellectual part of my mind. But that part of my mind is limited, actually, especially when it comes to relationships um, or intuition, it can block intuition. And intuition actually, I think, is going to be one of the master skills going forwards to kind of harness that intuition and creativity. Well, give me the master class. How do I harness my intuition? <laughs> you want that in a, in a few minutes? Basically, I think, yeah, because that's what we do. <laughs> <laughs> well, actually, if you ask, put me on the spot now, I would say, you know, everybody has this innate, deeper intelligence, which I would call your intuition. And I think we all have our own experience of that. And is everybody's equal? Hardly. I mean, some people are more intuitive, more clever, more lots of things. I don't know if everybody's is equal. I just know that everybody has it. And I think it's up to everybody to kind of develop that aspect of themselves. And like, I tend to think of people like being ice cream. We're all different flavors of ice cream. And, you know, who's to say if vanilla is better than strawberry? But my job is to bring out my own special flavor and make my own impact. But I think the key really is, first of all, understand that there's nothing to add in to get access to your intuition, go back to the addit additive subtractive. Really, I think, first of all, is to understand and value that it's there. It's innate. It's, you're born with it. And actually, it's incredibly valuable. And the gateway into it, the gateway into it is a calm mind. So the more you can actually understand how to remove the interference of a noisy mind, you see, one of the biggest problems, kind of that I'd see with my clients, I get major pushback on this, but once I get a little bit of momentum with a client, they never go back, is that the busy mind is the enemy of creativity and it's the enemy of um, accessing that intuition. And in my mind, and I've swallowed the Kool-Aid, obviously, it's the enemy of higher performance and happiness. Because like the more present I'm able to be, and this is going to be an increasing challenge in a world that is, you know, email is increasing, connectivity is increasing, people are busier and busier and stressed. And you have to ask yourself, where are we all going with this? And is it really, is it delivering on what, we, what we're looking for in business and in life? And my answer, which I'm surprised at, if you said to me five years ago, I would have thought we'd get better. All the research is pointing one way and we're going the opposite direction. So part of my work is trying to increase the awareness around, hey, look, there is actually a, a better way. Bizarrely, it isn't really that complicated. As business leaders, I think we're at the forefront of being able to uh, innovate and create new models that actually allow people to actually genuinely live better, but also work better. Because the model is kind of creaking at the seams at the moment. If you look at all the stats and the research around burnout in particular, 65 to 66% of people are on the edge of burnout. That's not a model for sustainable high performance. There's a problem with the existing model in business, but there's an opportunity within that model. And anybody who's an entrepreneur would know there's an opportunity within every challenge like that. And I would agree now, go back a few years. If what you're saying to me, and I think I'm hearing you correctly, is that you can, if you calm down, slow down, be far more reflective, that you then quieten down that mind. I'm old enough to remember, remember uh, there used to be a big move towards transcendental meditation, meditation yeah. and it was going to change the world and all. Well, it hasn't happened. No, I'm not mean, blaming uh, you now, but. Uh, well, well, I've <laughs> experimented with different types of meditation and I've actually tried and done transcendental meditation and I think it's, it's brilliant. I mean, it's so simple, it's brilliant. But there's very various forms of meditation, but on its own, it's not enough. You know, n nothing on its own like that is enough. But, you know, for me, what is meditation? Uh, meditation is just the skill of bringing your mind into the moment. Now, you can do that in many different ways. You can do that in a conversation. You can do it in playing golf. You can do it uh, in a meeting if you use the right approach. So there's many ways to do it. But really, I think it's more for leaders in particular to perhaps consider and be open to imagining a better way or be open to say, you know what, I wonder, can we, what's the, what's the business of the future look like? That's a different conversation though, isn't it? That's a, in my head, that's an external conversation where your team is around and you say, 
let's think differently about, I don't know, newspapers, TV, whatever things I'm interested in. Or is there a conversation that you have with yourself about a different way for you, it, not, it, for, not for the business? It, it is an external conversation, but I think, like, again, to my, what I realized myself over my career is that to create real change, I, I needed to work with the CEO. Because if I, once I got to work with the CEO, and then they had an inner experience of some of the stuff we're talking about in terms of, I mean, it's not just about walking around and just so we're clear, meditating on the mountain and it's all happy-go-lucky and, you know, that, that's not what I'm talking about because that's not business and that's not life. You're going to get points, you're going to get kicked and things are going to come at you. But like a high-performance athlete, you know, and if you look at all the elite sports at the moment, they are very much embracing the world of mindfulness, meditation, being more present. Absolutely, ideation as I well. I think ideation is fascinating. I used, I, think, I used to think it was a load of old rubbish until you start talking to people and you say, no, that's how I do it. How I, uh, Exactly, yeah. because in a way it's innate and you realise, hang on, that's what I'm doing. Yes. So the best things inside us are wired in there already. It's not that we need to learn anything extra. That's what I mean by, I don't necessarily need to add anything in. If you can get somebody to realise that, you know what, like knowledge is great, but it's not as good as my intuition or my innate abilities. Like we're, we're hardwired as humans for great stuff. And yet you have come across, because I certainly have come across, idiots who think that they know the answers and yeah. they are, maybe I shouldn't say it, but they're stupid. And they keep doing, as is it Einstein, whoever said, doing yeah. the same thing, the, the wrong, the, you know, how, how stupid can you be? The definition of insanity. Yeah, yeah. Keep doing the same thing, expecting different results. Yeah. Yeah. But, but like, you know, I've done that too, Connolly, you know, I mean, you know. We all have. We all have, and I, I'm, I'm often amazed at my own stupidity looking back at myself. You know, going back to your point about, you were talking about the exterior conversation. Like, you know, for me, it's down to results. This is down to results. So if you as the leader can experience a change, and there are many leaders now who are increasingly interested in mental fitness, the inner game, the psychology of success and performance, and also well-being and happiness. Like, it's, it's definitely increasing, but there's more to go. But once you as a leader understand, hang on, this is making a difference to me. I'm seeing a shift, not just in my calmness, but actually, to your point, my creativity, even my ability to communicate and just be calm under pressure. Mm, this is interesting. I wonder, can I use this with my team? And the answer has to be yes, but only if the leader kind of buys into it, goes, hang on a second here. This is, I can see tangible and intangible results here. Let's experiment. And that's, it is already happening to me, I just think we need to accelerate it. Like there's a great opportunity there. And again, going back to, like, it's not that you're not learning knowledge, but really for me, what I've learned over 30 years, and I've gone into all aspects of different elements of the mind and things like neurolinguistic programming and meditation and everything else. And I think that's what I'm trying to get across is that actually, look, we, we do need to educate ourselves about the inner workings of our mind. It's actually much simpler than probably most people think it is. But the starting point is at least to put a value on it and go, do you know what? Even if it's just around, even if it's just around that person listening to this, kind of going, uh, what inner voice are you talking about? And it's like, no, no, that inner voice is what I'm talking about. I'm saying that's the bit that you don't actually have to believe all the time. So if it's saying to you, my business is going to fail, it can be challenged. I've seen it happen. Like, so because that mindset is affected by so many different things. It doesn't mean that you know, if somebody's in a difficult situation that the reality is it's too late. But I've seen people in situations where the business is going through a tough time and we can catch the mindset, change that inner narration and actually allow it to come through and really transform itself. How quickly can you see change? It really depends on the person, but you could see change within a second. Really? Yeah, beca because again, I guarantee you, you know, somebody could be listening to this kind of going, hang on a second here. My inner voice has been telling me that I'm X, Y and Z. Your man is saying I don't have to listen to it. And I'm saying, yeah, you don't. Yeah, you could change. You can change the movie in your head and it could literally happen straight away, but it doesn't necessarily, and it doesn't happen for everybody just like that. But the inner voice might be right about you, absolutely. your ability and the failing of your business. Absolutely, yeah, absolutely. But I suppose the thing I'd look at with the client is, the first thing I'd look to do is kind of try and reset your mood. So at least we're going to get your mood back up to a certain point. So reset my mood. How do you do that? Um, when is your mood off? At the moment, no, I love being in the studio, you see. I'm in my happy place here. Then, then we can't reset your mood. <laughs> no, but I'm thinking of it for, for our listeners who may, may are not well, feeling I so good. Look, I'll tell you how I reset my mood. So I'll check. Your mood, your mood is going up and down all the time. It's going up and down all the time, like Absolutely. an elevator. Yeah. And I suppose for me, I'll generally have a little rule with myself that if my mood goes below 7 out of 10, 
I just check my thinking. And generally what you'll find is that your thinking quality has gone down. It's generally a little bit more negative is what I'd find. Or perhaps the inner critic has kind of come in a little bit stronger. And for me, my job then is to just not listen to a single word that it's saying. And once I, once I do that, it, it doesn't have a hold on my mood. It's quite possible, this is going to sound maybe a little bit strange, to have a low mood, but not to be caught up with it. And most people, that would be a game changer enough to go, hang on, I mean, I can have a low mood or just not listen to my inner voice. Absolutely, if you don't listen to it. So that's, that's step one. And the step, thing, step two could be, for example, I had a client last week who, you know, has a really good business. They're going through a pinch point with cash at the moment. It's going through a tough time and their state was low. And so part of my job is I'm talking to them, I, I want to get a picture. I'm very practical. If you saw me talking to them, it's very practical. I went through every aspect of the business. What's going on with this? I want to get a sense on reality so that I can at least talk to them and say, when their mind goes maybe overly negative, say, well, hang on a second here now. That's not reality. Reality is this, this, and this based on what you just told me. And so once I'm clear on reality, then I can actually look then to move their mood up. Now, how do I do that? Of course, you can do that by saying, listen, you know, what are practical steps we can do here over the next seven days that actually make a difference? So now they're focused on an action. And what am I doing? You're really trying to distract them away from the inner voice that maybe just gets in at you and starts to kind of get you down. So anybody who's in business, you know, at any level, especially these days, everybody should relate to having their mood go up and down like a yo-yo. And some days like it can go up, it's easy to go up when you win a deal or things are going your way. The challenge and test comes in any business when things are not going exactly your way or people are letting you down. That's kind of like a starting point for what I'd normally do if I was talking to somebody. We always say on the show that we're, we have business insights, tips and opportunities and we love the insights. So two more insights. Okay, well, let's see. Um, well, I suppose, look, I think a, a common one that I shared anyway would be how you start your day is critically important, critically important to how your business goes. And I tend to kind of talk to my clients and say, just, just think in one day increments. You know, a lot can happen in 24 hours. But the start of the day would be for me to kind of go into what I would call um, a 3C state where it's calm, clear and centered. So the very first 30 minutes of my day, um, and I encourage my clients to do the same, is I just take some time out to, now it might be a little bit of meditation like you talked about earlier on, or it could be uh, to read something inspirational. But in particular, what I'd say to them is take a few minutes and I want you to play in your mind your day going the way you want it to go. I yep. want you to see yourself interacting in a positive way, energetic way. You're back like to ideation again, are you? Or is that the same idea, isn't it? It is to a degree, but in that case, I suppose to me, you know, as I said, as I'd say in the book, The Inner CEO, your mind's like a projector and your mind's like a missile. So your mind's like a projector. So whatever you play in your mind, you will feel. So if I'm playing my day going well, that changes my mood, brings my mood up. If my mood is up, my thinking quality is better. So I'm just telling my mind, this is the way I'd like it to go. And then your mind is like a missile. You move towards what you're focused on. So I'm telling my mind, this is kind of the, this is the way I'd like it to go, whether it's an outcome or the way, maybe the process or the way I'd like to be in my day. Bizarrely, I guarantee you, if some people listening to this do those, use those two things during the, at the start of the day, they will get a pleasant surprise and say, do you know what's weird is actually my day went a little bit more like that than perhaps not. It doesn't guarantee that SH1T doesn't come at you, Connell, um, because that's, you're going to get punched. But actually, I've, I've just seen it too many times over the years with clients that by doing that simple thing, just taking time to imagine your day, see the outcomes you want, play it for a few minutes. It's incredible what it can do in terms of setting you off in the right direction. Okay, I'm listening, I'm listening. So, listen, you've been kind enough to come in, so you better talk about your own business, exactly what you do. and what you, <laughs> <laughs> No, this is what we say, you know, we're on your side. We're trying to make sure that your business survives as well. So, what is your business? Who do you look after? How do you look after them? And uh, talk about the book. I sometimes struggle to describe how my, what my business is, but I'll just, that's what I, give, I give it to you and you can tell me if it's clear enough. I suppose I run a coaching consultancy business and most of my clients are uh, CEOs, business owners and C-suite executives. Do they have to be like serious businesses or can they be a small business? Depends. No, actually I'd say about 70% of my clients would be what you would call SME. 30% would be larger. And um, a lot of it kind of just depends on the person. So I, I can get all sorts of inquiries. Um, I, I, I do a lot of stuff one-to-one, uh, -one, but I do also do a lot of stuff in terms of groups. So they've got different group programs going on and especially the SMEs in particular might go into the group programs. The one-to-one -one stuff doesn't necessarily suit everybody and it's probably, it's a higher price point as well. Um, and my clients will be in Ireland, uh, the UK, and a couple in the US as well. How do you zoom into the US, is it, or something Absolutely, like that? yeah. Look, I mean, I think I was lucky um, insofar as COVID for me was good. You know, I was lucky to be on the right side because I was ready with the technology. And if I'm being honest, I had been trying to get a lot of my CEO clients in particular to, 
you gravitate towards Zoom and most of them resisted. In fact, yeah, I would say 90% of them didn't want to do it. But uh, we were ready. And so it, basically everything goes through video now, mostly. And how do you find clients in the US? As in, how do you, you know, how do you pitch them? Sorry, originally, when you're out fishing for them, how do you find them? Most of my business, I would say 90% of it, and I do like plenty of stuff in terms of online advertising and the book and things like that, but 90% is referral, word of mouth. So it's really down to that. It comes like, and you know, in, in my business, I think your results are your best advertising. So once As you, always, I hope. Yeah, yeah. well, I, I, I think so. You know, you try to do other things, but especially in the world of mindset or the inner game or even coaching, you know, you, you see a lot of stuff online, which can be, I think, style over substance, which sometimes you're competing against. But generally, my best clients will always come through word of mouth. Because like people, like-minded people are, re- re- refer like-minded people. Did you read my email where I said that we have a final question? I did. Oh, thank God. And also, I was, I was, my, my inner voice was kind of going, you're going to offend a lot of people here by leaving them out. So, <laughs> well, you can, I thought of somebody. Well, that's cool because you may say as many as you wish, but uh, I, you know, a lot of people say, yeah, no, I can't say it because my Aunt Millie will be upset or whatever. Yeah. Who would yeah. you hire in a heartbeat? Well, you see, I'm very lucky. Um, when I thought about this, I'm very lucky that I, I've worked with so many really unbelievable people that I think, wow, like how did they do that? Like, you know, so I'm, I'm lucky I get, I get to work up close. But the person I, that I thought about, the hosp- you had somebody on in your last show about the hospitality sector, which has really been oh, challenged at the moment yeah. in Ireland um, and actually globally. Adrian, yeah. Yeah, Adrian, yeah. And really intelligent, smart guy, very experienced. You can um, actually feel him bleed you can actually hear his oh my god yeah you know, just I, worn I, out yeah, yeah worn out you know and as he said like a lot of like restaurants close and things like that and you know I could hear him asking for it legitimate support from the government things like that which is very valid but then the person that I that I thought about is somebody that I know very well in that sector in Ireland who has I, I joke with him he's just, he's just an incredible innovator great pair of shoulders unbelievable enthusiasm and he fights the good fight and he just runs a really, really great organization, great leader, great person, and he takes on a lot, but he's a, just a great adapter. And he is the owner of a restaurant group called Saba Restaurant Group. I don't know if you know Saba. I do, Dunham, I do. Yeah. Yes, so yeah. Paul Cadden is his name. And Paul is just somebody, yeah, if you, I, you know, there's, I, I'm not, I want to make sure I don't offend any other people that I work with. <laughs> Or know very you're well. You're all lovely people. Yeah, no, Paul all amazing, is really lovely. Lovely. But you know what? I just thought, um, in fairness, we're coming into spring. And you know what? If anybody, just to give Saba a plug, because they, they are an incredible Thai Vietnamese offering and takeaways, restaurants, um, and more exciting stuff he's going to be launching soon as well. But um, yeah, Paul Cat and Saba Restaurant Group. And so even we're coming into spring and summer. And I just think, let's get people out eating again. Cool. Have the restaurant industry. That's a nice suggestion. And that is also Shane Craddock, C R A D. I'm not allowed to say a second D. That's it, one D. O-C-K. My dad would be delighted with you, Connor. Yeah. <laughs> one D. And his book is The Inner CEO, which I have in my paw here. And it is by. No, it's. Ivory House. Yeah, but actually, do you know what? That's, Online. That's my company. I set it up. Oh, is it? Okay. Yeah, well, so it's, it's. We set so it's it up. It's a and everything. Yeah. Exactly. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Well, I just thought when I looked at it, I thought, you know what? I want to do it a certain way and I had more flexibility that way. So. Lovely. Yeah. It's a nice looking book was, uh, from what I've seen here. Thank you. Yeah. That's Shane. Shane, thank you so much for joining us on that great business show. Thank you. It's all go like Chrissy Gno on that great business show.com. That great business show. De facto, the revolutionary shaving oil, changing the face of shaving. For the smoothest shave of your life, just add water. No more lathering up or cleaning up afterward. Just add a few drops of water and you're ready to go. De facto's blend of all natural oils hydrates and protects your skin. No more razor burns or irritation. A spa treatment for your face. Perfect for all skin types and lasts so much longer than traditional foams or gels. De facto, a shaving revolution. Just add water. Available from selected pharmacies and from defactoshave.com. And that is it from episode 184 of That Great Business Show. Great business insights and inspiration. And regular listeners know that we're true believers in business mentors. So do make sure to check out mentorswork.ie to unlock the full potential of your business. It's a fully government funded mentoring program. Also, sign up for email updates and we will send you your own personal copy of the podcast at thatgreatbusinessshow.com. Do share us, do like us, do give us five-star reviews. It helps us every time. And you can, of course, advertise with us, greatbusinessshow.com. 
because we have a lovely, lovely audience. And we recorded the Dublin South Podcast Studios, where today's studio engineer is Alison Odwire. A huge thanks, as always, for her professionalism. And later, the dynamic duo of studio manager Peter Rice and post-production engineer Neil Horner ensure we remain the world's best-sounding business podcast. So for me, Conal O'Moran, we to you all. Agus Slán Tamal.